Hello and welcome to our big talk. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Jennifer Meir from Martin Curry, our silver sponsor. And she is here to join us to introduce our big talk. Thank you, Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Dane. As um, Dane said, I'm Jen Mayer, and I'm Chief Operating Officer at Martin Curry, a global investment manager headquartered here in Edinburgh. At Martin Curry, we've been working with Salvus and Mindroom for about a year, as we want to learn more about neurodiversity. As an investment manager, our clients trust us to invest their money by picking the right companies for them around the world to invest in. Harnessing the power of diversity and unique perspectives to make great investment decisions is what we're all about. And in order to make great decisions, we, need, we know we need to have a culture where people can thrive and fulfill their potential. Understanding neuro neurodiversity is a really important part of this. So that's why Martin Curry is delighted to be sponsoring the It Takes All Kinds of Minds conference. And I'm really delighted to be introducing our first big talk speaker of the conference, Rory Bremner. Rory is, will be known to many of us and loved by many of us as the UK's top satirical impressionist. He's also a writer, a skilled presenter, and a wonderful communicator. And he's also been diagnosed later in life with ADHD. Rory is here today to talk to us about how ADHD has shaped his life and work. I'm delighted to welcome Rory to the stage. Hello. Sorry, it's quite a long walk from there to there, <laughs> so I should have got a taxi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you. Um, first of all, welcome, by the way, um, uh, to Edinburgh. It's my hometown. Uh, I should just tell you, it doesn't rain all the time um, in Edinburgh, just most of the time. As uh, Billy Connolly, the great Scottish comedian, he said, he said that in Scotland, there's two seasons, winter and July. <laughs> so we're in winter right now. Um, Amongst other things today, I'm going to be saying this is our time. There's a lot to celebrate. Um, and today, we really should start by celebrating the fact that last night, ADHD won nine Oscars at Hollywood. Everything, everywhere, all at once, isn't it? And actually, I, I was just doing my last minute research. And um, here's about the director. Uh, and this is what the director said. Uh, the pair initially conceptualized Evelyn as a woman with undiagnosed ADHD, a condition that in a way makes her uniquely equipped to tap into other universes. But worried about treating the diagnosis reductively, Kwan started looking into it more deeply and was led to a startling revelation. I basically stayed up until four in the morning just researching. I was like, oh no, what the hell? Because it never crossed my mind that I could have ADHD. <laughs> He'd eventually be officially diagnosed after spending a year with a therapist, suddenly giving him a new understanding of his brain and his struggles as a child. It also offered a new way of seeing both his own mother and Evelyn, who's the lead character in the film. This is a big part of what makes Evelyn feel so unique and alive. The fact that she has this thing that I relate to and that I felt for most of my life, this overwhelming feeling of wanting to do so much but then not being able to do any of it, Guan says. But uh, it's an amazing film. I couldn't quite follow it because I didn't entirely concentrate, surprisingly. Um, but anyway, um, but it's true. It, it, there, there we are. We're winning. Um, Edinburgh, welcome. This is an amazing, it's very, very appropriate that we're here. Um, I was born here, as I said, and uh, Sean Connery was also born here. He was a milkman in Fountain Bridge. Uh, she started out delivering milk, and uh, he loved this city. He said that it was... Uh, it was full of some of the greatest shites in the world. <laughs> I think he meant sites. I think he meant sites anyway. Um, but also, this is the capital of Enlightenment Scotland. We're talking about all kinds of minds. And Sophie, by the way, I, we should give her a round of applause for bringing everyone together. She's done such a wonderful job. And I must get used to this. This is wonderful. Um, we did the Playhouse last night, and it was a 2,500-seat theatre, people with kazoos. And nobody was doing this, so I'm really, really, I'm really pleased. Um, so yes, so it, it, Edinburgh was a city at the heart of the Enlightenment uh, in Scotland. Uh, and Voltaire said at the time, he said, uh, we look to Scotland for all new ideas of civilization. Well, he didn't actually say that. He said, pour trouver des idées nouvelles sur la civilisation, nous nous tournons vers l'Écosse. Um, at the time of the Act of Union in 1707, Scotland had five universities to England's two. Take that, England. Um, <laughs> In Scotland, in the 18th century, you find the economist Adam Smith, the philosopher David Hume, the architects Robert Adam and William Chambers, the geologist James Hutton. If you have a look at Salisbury Crags, he did so much about uh, the movement of rocks and rocks formation. Um, 
Burke and Hare, of course, famously, um, you may have heard uh, Burke and Hare, the famous um, murderers they were, um, and they carried, out the, they carried out their business about three or 400 yards uh, down the road in Westport, the Westport murders, and what they did was they provided bodies for Robert Knox, who was a professor of anatomy at uh, Edinburgh University, famous for its medical school, and this is something about the duality of Edinburgh. Uh, there's a dark side, there's a light side, there's an old town and a new town where on the edge of the old town at the moment, the new town is over Princess Street, which was built in 1760, I think, um, designed um, just 20 years after the clans, Scottish clans had been wiped out at Culloden and Edinburgh was redesigned and they named the streets very subtly and tactfully, they named the streets Hanover Street, Charlotte Street, Frederick Street, George Street, after the, uh, the Brit British monarchy. And they were going to call Princess Street St. Giles Street, but uh, the king said, no, I wanted it called after my sons, so it became Princess Street. So it's a wonderful, wonderful city. It's absolutely the heart um, of, of the Enlightenment, so it's the most appropriate uh, setting. It's also actually like Rome, um, it was built on seven hills, and it shares many features uh, with, with, the, with the Eternal City. Cobbled streets, classical architecture, and 10,000 Italian restaurants. <laughs> so um, enjoy. Um, as I say, I was doing a show last night at the Playhouse with Jack D, um, and uh, I said, I'm talking at an ADHD conference tomorrow. He said, how are you going to keep their attention? Absolutely typical, and it is, it's a challenge. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a challenge actually, it has been in the challenge to find the venue um, and to get there on time. I don't know if you've had struggles today, I'm sure you do always with these things I find. People share, they say, oh God, I got on the wrong train, I got the timing wrong. A few years ago, I arrived at the Signet Library uh, in Edinburgh to speak at a dinner, only to find it was on the next day. So we had to find a local restaurant, I think it was Pizza Express, uh, and sit there, me in black tie, uh, and my wife in an evening gown, uh, pretending it was perfectly normal. Um, last summer, just a few months ago, I managed to persuade two of my uh, friends who are impressionists to travel all the way up to Scotland to do a show at the book festival. Uh, we were billed as the Scottish impressionists, haha. Uh, only to realize two days before the event that I was due to ho host a business awards thing in Oxford the same evening. Luckily, we use, we, we get, we're used to the technology now, uh, and I did it on Zoom in a tiny cupboard in Oxford, and they sat on stage either side of a big screen uh, in a tent in the borders. And we turned it into a whole sort of feature, and they interviewed me down the line as, as Donald Trump. So it all worked out so well, so well, beautifully. <laughs> and I talked about Scotland. I love Scotland, beautiful country, and uh, I came here with the Romans, okay? I came here with Hadrian, Hadrian, tremendous gentleman, great man, and he built the wall. You know the wall, the tremendous Hadrian's wall, and let me tell you, don't get many Mexicans in Scotland, let me tell you. <laughs> so that's what it is, very, very beautiful. Uh, see, straight away, I'm off the subject. But actually, I'm bang on the subject, because it's just, that's the way my brain works, and quite possibly the way his brain works, let me <laughs> ADHD, I don't know, but let me tell I have more comorbidities. <laughs> I have the best comorbidities <laughs> of anybody in the world. So instead of taking the straight route, I like to go off on, on a tangent. And um, so that makes a, actually being a comedian a perfect job for somebody um, with ADHD. I did ask my agent um, how many comedians on her books uh, have ADHD, and she said, I think probably all of them. Um, in the last few years, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few comedians in the UK um, have had a diagnosis in their 40s or their 50s. Angela Barnes, Johnny Vegas, Sue Perkins. Um, look at the brilliant, soaring genius of, of Robin Williams, and that brilliance came from an absolute firework display um, of a brain. I think he said, you're only given a little spark of madness, but you mustn't lose it. So there's a lot to celebrate today as well. Um, as I'll talk about later, uh, for me, ADHD is both my best friend and my worst enemy. Uh, because Worst enemy because it's not fun being disorganized or impulsive or forgetful, but best friend because it's what allows me to make random connections, to jump from idea to idea, to not have a filter, because we now know that the parts of the brain, the networks uh, that are less developed in ADHD brains are the ones that regulate impulsivity, the ones that stop us from being impetuous or irrepressible. So if that's missing, it's a great thing. If you think of Lee Mack or Robin Williams, able to think so fast and so brilliantly because they don't have that filter in the way. 
So what am I going to talk about today? Um, it's great. ADHD and me, that's very um, <laughs> egotistical, isn't it? That's great. Um, but uh, I do know about this. I have been researching it um, for 60 years now. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about my own experience of ADHD and what I've learned, um, my own diagnosis, uh, something about how to cope with it, uh, a bit of the history of ADHD and the breakthroughs and recognition of neurodiversity, um, a word about medication, um, a bit of a rant about the pushback against uh, ADHD, uh, a slight rant about CAMS, um, uh, and a message of hope. Um, then we'll break for dinner about six o'clock. Um, <laughs> is anyone doing anything before Thursday? Just to establish this work. Okay, so here we go. I came across um, ADHD so more than 10 years ago, in fact, because somebody in my family um, was diagnosed, and I recognized those symptoms um, in me. And this happens quite often. I was just talking to somebody from Dyslexia Scotland, and we talked about Jackie Stewart, three times world motor racing champion in 69 and 71 and 73. Um, profoundly dyslexic. Uh, he won those three world motor racing championships and many races in between, I think 99, Grand Prix, he won 27, he won three world champions, championships. Um, but even to this day, he said he can't recite the alphabet. Um, his, with letters and uh, things, he still finds that terribly difficult. He took his son to have a diagnosis, and they said, your son is dyslexic. And he said, well, I, I recognize a lot of this. Would you actually carry out uh, an assessment on me? And they did an assessment, and lo and behold, they said, well, Jackie, you are profoundly dyslexic. And he just burst into tears because the last, for 40 years, he'd been told that he was stupid in class, he'd been humiliated, even in adulthood, people would say, oh, you know, he's, uh, Max Mosley, who died recently, described him as a certified idiot. I mean, this is just because of his dyslexia. But he went on and still, I saw him last weekend in Bahrain, he is still networking, he's still working all around the globe as an ambassador for so many different brands, um, a fantastic role model, a great Scot, and he has a dyslexia diagnosed um, in, in later life. Um, my own uh, diagnosis, I recognize, as I say, I recognize these symptoms, and um, it all made sense, the irrepressibility, the, uh, I used to blurt out in lectures. I just wanted to apologize to people I was at school with and uh, at university with for, for the child I'd been. My mum called me scatty. Um, I was always a little bit forgetful. Um, I was at school up the road, and I remember the pitches were frozen, so we didn't play rugby, um, ended up playing football. And I remember tackling our own centre forward, <laughs> who was about to score a goal. And I tackled our own centre forward and shot and missed the goal by about 50 feet. And I, to this day, I think, what was I doing? And it was just that just complete mad rush of blood um, to the head. In university, I was uh, talking in seminars and things, and I, I would sort of think, if there was a silence, I would have to jump in there until somebody pointed out that there wasn't a silence at all. Um, it's like the actress. Edith Evans, I think she was in a play, and she said to the director, what do I do, what do I do during that pause? And the director said, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a, there's a pause there. She said, what, what do you mean? She said, the pause while that man's speaking. <laughs> because it's the, that's the irrepressibility of it. Um, now, a lot of people say, well, we all have those characteristics of impetuosity and irrepressibility or forgetful. We all have that uh, at some time, and we absolutely do. But the key is with ADHD, it is when that becomes impairing or overwhelming and makes it difficult to hold down a job or hold down a relationship, when it becomes really debilitating. And that um, is when you, do, you need help. Um, to, I'm, I'm imagining that a fair amount of you are very familiar with ADHD, but people talk about it as the old cliche about a Ferrari, uh, a Ferrari engine uh, with no brakes. Um, or I t often think about it as if you're in a department store and you look at uh, a row of televisions and they're on all sorts of different cha channels and you're flicking between the channels mentally. But then sometimes they all switch onto the same channel. You have this ability as well to hyper-focus, something that really, really uh, focuses the mind. Um, you can then shut off the rest of the world for hours at a time. There are people 
even now, who are only able to do what they do because they have ADHD, they have these incredibly focused minds. I mentioned Jackie Stewart, um, Lewis Hamilton, also in Bahrain uh, last year. He's spoken um, of his uh, ADHD, which um, allows his brain to be fast, but also allows it to focus absolutely intensely on what he's doing. Um, think about an open plan office, perhaps. If you're, if you're in an open plan office, you're, uh, on, you're watching your computer screen, all sorts of emails are coming in, things are flashing up, you're getting WhatsApp messages, your phone is next to you, that is bleeping away with messages all the time. Uh, the person next to you is on the phone, there's two screens on the wall showing Sky News and Sky Sport, um, and then ambulances going past. All those things are happening at the same time. Well, that's what it can be like uh, having ADHD. Um, and, it's like, and it can be like that all, all the time. And that's kind of how we, talk, earlier on, the first speaker talked about the what and the why. Um, so if our brains are like that, why is that happening? And just very briefly, my um, simplistic understanding is that um, it's a, it is a neurodevelopmental condition. By the way, I think it's a misnomer, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. First of all, I don't like to think of it as a disorder as a condition, so that's the last D, uh, it's, it's not a disorder. And the D, uh, the, the, the attention deficit, the first D, um, it's not attention deficit, it's not that we're lacking attention, it's an attention surfeit. It's we've got so much attention, but we're not necessarily giving it to the things we're supposed to be giving our attention to. So we're sort of working with, with a misnomer. I think it's attention surfeit uh, hyperactivity condition. Now that's hard enough for adults, but for children, uh, when you think about it, we've got an education system uh, that is predicated on sitting still uh, and listening hard. And that's incredibly difficult for an ADHD brain. So people, they're seen uh, in school as being disruptive because they're restless, uh, they fall into bad company. I was lucky because my name begins with B, um, so I sat at the front of the class. Uh, and so if, I, if my name began with Z, I'd be in trouble because I'd have been at the back of the class and the opportunities to be distracted or to talk to my neighbor or to all these sort of things would have been much, much uh, harder to resist. As it was, I was under the teacher's nose and I wanted to impress the teacher. So I had that. I think I'm right in saying though, in Sweden, if a child is excluded from school twice, if they're sent out of class, uh, that he or she will be screened. But interestingly, not just for ADHD, they look at all, uh, a lot of other factors, uh, other learning differences, such as dyslexia, um, possible mental health problems, all, as Sophie said at the beginning, all kinds of minds uh, with a holistic approach. And that really is what we should be aiming at so that children in school who are struggling are picked up early. Uh, because it's really, really important um, to understand this. That ADHD does not cause bad behavior. It's not a behavioral disorder. It's a neurodevelopmental condition affecting cognitive functioning that impacts on your learning. It's also a developmental delay in some parts of the brain um, that also impacts on emotional regula regulation as well as cognition. This is why kids may appear less mature than their peers. I've only got one slide to show you. Let, have a look at this. This is a, um, this was given to me many years ago when I was doing a documentary by Professor Peter Hills. And he said, have a look at this. This is the a neurotypical nine-year-old brain, if I've got this right. So we have a look at this. <clears throat> In your own time. We might have a coffee break or a piece of music while we're waiting for this. Uh, there it is. Okay, so there we have uh, a, a, a neurotypical nine-year-old. Okay, so let's, the blue parts are parts of the brain and the networks in the brain that are developed or developing. Okay, have a look at that. And now, look at an ADHD brain. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, imagine trying to, how you can cope when it's like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle when half the pieces, not that they're missing, it's just that they, they're, they're not there, they haven't developed yet it, to the same extent that they have on the left. And you think of one child on the, on the right struggling at school and being told, oh, you're just being disruptive, you're being difficult, and compare that to the equipment that you've got if you're neurotypical. Um, and that's always stood out as a sort of graphic um, demonstration. Uh, Behaviour that's in, inappropriate in the classroom, not concentrating, fidgeting, getting up and moving about, procrastination, difficulty with uh, task initiation, the kind of things that can be incorrectly misinterpreted by the teacher as not doing what they're told. They're not necessarily 
chosen behavior by the child. It, instead, it can be a combination of, of cognitive impairment, of forgetting, of anxiety, extreme anxiety. The brain's natural in, instinctive response to producing more dopamine is to move. Is to, that's why children fidget. That's what causes hyperactivity. It's an instinctive response to what the environment is asking of them. It's not a moral problem. Uh, it's often mistaken by the teachers as refusing to follow instructions or being lazy or not trying hard enough. And interestingly, we think of children with ADHD as presenting as, as restless and disruptive, but the majority of children with ADHD don't actually get into trouble at school. They may underachieve academically, but they stay under the radar. These are the children that the teachers don't refer because they they're looking for the disruptive ones, not the ones that are struggling academically because they, they just assume that they're low ability or, or lazy. And that's why many kids with ADHD are never diagnosed or supported, especially girls, incidentally. It's also worth knowing that ADHD never travels alone. 30% of those with ADHD are also autistic. 42% uh, are also dyslexic or dyscalculic. So, but no one ever screens for that because it costs money. You'll be familiar that most, uh, par uh, most parents pay for this themselves because Ofsted in this country actively discourages screening. Uh, heaven knows why, maybe because they want the number of neurodiverse children to remain below the DOV target, the Department of Education target of 15%. So sadly, the inappropriate behavior that's the product of pervasive learner anxiety can end up being put down mistakenly to that single diagnosis and that enduring myth of ADHD equals bad behavior. So what happens to those children? What happens to those who are, they, they, they can fall into bad company at the back of the classroom. Uh, they can end up self-medicating with drink or drugs. Um, we talk about this move from the classroom to the courtroom where something like 25% of the juvenile offender population, of the young prison population, something like 25% are diagnosably ADHD. Just imagine if we pick this up in schools early. It would be fantastic, just transformative if the children, not only the ones who, as I said, traditionally this kind of slightly lazy thing about being restless or disruptive, but the ones who are performing, uh, who are struggling at school and who are under the radar, if we pick this up, it would be absolutely transformative. Um, because of doing a documentary, a lot of people have sort of come up and ask for advice. They ask for advice about being an impressionist as well, and they say, my, ch my child's really good at doing voices. What advice would you give them? And I say, well, tell them to read the Bible. And they say, why is that? I said, well, it won't stop him, but it'll slow him down for a few years. <laughs> <coughs> on, uh, on ADHD, um, I suppose, <clears throat> what would my advice be? Well, tell you, uh, first, first of all, before I get here, I've, I've jumped ahead, I'll tell you about... Um, my diagnosis. Um, I did it uh, as part of the documentary because I wanted, having recognized, I think most people, when they go for a diagnosis, they're pretty sure that they have it anyway. Uh, it's not so, so if you do get a diagnosis, okay, that just confirms something, as we saw with the director of the film, confirms something that I'd thought for years, that you know that there's something going on that makes you different, sometimes trips you up, makes you who you are. Um, but. When I went for the diagnosis, it was in the course of making a documentary. And it's a difficult thing because it's a subjective, it's like a questionnaire and an assessment. And the following day I was going, I did this as part of the filming, and the following day I was on the top deck of a bus going to the next location. And I just burst into tears and I couldn't understand why it was. And I worked out that as part of the diagnosis, you spent, I'd spent the whole day uh, concentrating on the failures in my life and where I, where I was failing, because most, most of my life is about projecting confidence and projecting success. And I'd spent a whole day during this assessment thinking, God, I fail at that, I'm not very good at this, I'm not very good at that. And that can be very, very overwhelming. So the process of diagnosis is something that has to be very, very carefully handled, I think. Um, uh, but as far as people ask me for advice, it's because, uh, do you know, my, my, my phone keeps beeping, so I guess I, have to, I think I might just do that. Um, so um, the, where's my page? I'm getting at Boris Johnson here. I, 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 I can talk about Peppa Pig. <laughs> Peppa Pig and his great, uh, and his great, uh, you know, his great things. Yes, uh, where are we? Um, yes. Um, so the advice that I give is 
if you have ADHD, don't, you must not beat yourself up because it's so easy to do. The levels, because when you, when you make a mistake, we've forgotten something again, you've messed up in school again, you've been distracted by something, you've been impetuous. The important thing is not to beat yourself up about it. Uh, and also, if you're a parent, it's, it's difficult because if you have a go at your child, that child will already be well, well down that journey of telling itself off and saying, why did I do that? I don't want to do that again. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain there. So don't beat yourself up because it makes you who you are. And as I said already, there are so many great advantages uh, to, having, um, to having ADHD. If you're able to learn to embrace um, the madness, as it were, uh, to just to, to almost laugh at it, in a sense, um, if you're able to do that and use the good bits. Um, remember, the thing about ADHD, it's, this is not a gene that's been sort of bred out and eliminated. That, it's actually selected for, which means that uh, I spoke to a great um, ADHD expert, Eric Taylor, years ago, uh, and he said, um, we need people with ADHD. He said, we're the ones that eat the poison fruit. <laughs> you know, people with ADHD, we tend to be the pathfinders. There. We tend to be those who are um, out there, the trailblazers, um, if you like. So um, we must embrace that and celebrate that and not be beating ourselves up. Um, but having said that, you know, it, it can be miserable. I mean, when I talk about the amazing abilities of hyper-focus and what it gives you and, and what you can do. People say, well, what about my child? My child finds it very, very difficult. And there are those things where it's difficult to find friends. It's difficult to make friends because they think that you're different. They think you're sort of slightly weird um, in some way. Um, and, you know, that's something that, that, that is really hard to deal with. It's hard to struggle with. Um, but that can be overcome. And, uh, you know, other kids can sort of just find you because you're different, because you have no filter. Uh, they have their friendship groups, and I see this time and time again. They have their friendship groups, and the one with ADHD uh, invites people to the party, and then guess what? On the day of the party, they suddenly find they've got something better to do. And it's very humiliating. So, you know, these children, they need, they need support. They need help. Um, how do you cope as an adult with it? How do I cope? I'm obsessive about writing lists. I write lists, and sometimes I'll go back and I'll put in things I've already done onto the list just for the satisfaction of crossing. Yeah, there's another one, you do that as well. So that is, I mean, list making is a brilliant way to keep yourself on track. Um, the best way of all is you find a job where having ADHD is an asset and not a liability. I mean, I talk about uh, being a comedian, but um, there are uh, many people out there who are tremendous athletes. Look at um, Michael Phelps, of course, um, and Simone Biles, um, because they found uh, an outlet for their energy and they have, you know, superhuman energy and I'll come on to later on there are people um, the world is full of examples of people who have either um, stated they have ADHD or we look back historically and um, Leonardo da Vinci an example that uh, they've done so retrospectively and they've looked at his writings and his work and have established that he would be nowadays in that in, in today's context diagnosed as having ADHD that's not a bad role model to have by the way um, Medication also comes into it. Um, I've just thrown my phone away, uh, and that had on it um, uh, something I need, actually. Um, <laughs> hang on. Hello, you're still there. Um, and this is a friend of mine, and uh, I sort of said, well, talk, talk about the experience of being on meds. Uh, after my diagnosis, he wrote and said, uh, welcome to the club. Let's speak when you get back, and I can tell you the secret handshake. <laughs> he said, um, it's... Definitely a funny experience uh, being diagnosed because it was crisis that drove me to get a diagnosis and the confirmation was largely a relief. At the same time though, there were mixed feelings. Uh, what could my life have been like if I'd known? And now I'm at the other end, I know those are wasted emotions, but it's something I had to deal with at the time. Then he talked about medication. On the meds front, they helped me massively. For me, it's like going from listening to music underwater to sitting in a concert hall. The clarity of my thought and purpose is transformed. For me, the beds definitely don't stifle creativity. In fact, I can now finally get organized to see some of my ideas through to fruition. I can still go on flights of fancy, grab hold and run with ideas that others miss, and hyper-focus when I want to. And the difference is I know when that's appropriate and useful and when it's not. If there's something else I actually need to do, then I can switch off the excited puppy inside and tell it to lie down for a while until I have a better slot. It's a lovely analogy, isn't it? Um, 
what I wanted to talk about was, um, I think it's our time. It's our time. We've got so much better understanding and so much better um, awareness in society of, um, of mental health. It's really a thing that's been, it's been coming over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, over the last Labour government was particularly hot on dyslexia, I think. Um, and now, um, ADHD, it's absolutely our time. The, the science uh, is catching up. As I showed you that uh, um, sort of rather rudimentary brain scan, but much more brain scan work is being done. And we're really realizing, as I said before, that this is not what it was thought of traditionally as being a moral or behavioral thing. We're understanding from looking at brains, ADHD brains, that it's a neurodevelopmental um, condition. It's been quite a journey that ADHD has been on. It was people still talked about in the old days and we're trying to get over this stigma talking about bad parents or naughty children. My parents died 20 years ago. It's not my parents' fault. You know, I don't have parents um, to blame. Um, it was, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a thing, I suppose, that's been talked about for 250 years. Uh, the first one was uh, Melchior Weichard, a German scientist who really sort of identified the inattentive forms of ADHD, and he actually prescribed horseback riding and gymnastic exercises as treatment. You think, and look, 250 years later, the world's greatest gymnast, Simone Biles, when the Russians hacked her medical records, lo and behold, she was on Ritalin because she has ADHD. She's the greatest gymnast in the world. Um, 1798, we had Alexander Crichton, who was born here uh, in Edinburgh. He concentrated and identified that people being distracted and unable to focus. In 1902, we had Sir George Still. That's a great name for somebody who's, <laughs> isn't that? Say, so, uh, so have you got a very restless child? Yes, hello. Uh, this is Sir George Still. Um, he'll teach you what to do. Um, in the 1930s, back to Germany again, and doctors were starting to identify um, what they call hyperkinetic uh, disease. They called the disease there hyperkinetic. Again, what was picked up was that presentation of being, of being restless. 1937, big breakthrough, Charles Bradley, um, American uh, doctor, and he was the first to prescribe stimulants to um, his patients. It's, it's extraordinary. You think it'd be completely counterintuitive. You have children who are bouncing off the walls and you think, I know what these children need is stimulation. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? But guess what? It worked because of this, um, uh, th this condition which is about having dopamine the brain, in, in the case of an ADHD brain, as I say, my rudimentary understanding is that we're not producing sufficient dopamine, to, dopamine that neurotransmitter that, that both rewards and stimulates. You know when you're in the zone and you're concentrating and you're feeling, you know, this is going really well and I'm, I know what I'm doing and I'm flying and I'm in the, in the zone. Um, and with ADHD, that's not produced um, in adequate quantities. And yet, so the stimulant medicine uh, is able to, to replicate that. So instead of you... Uh, running around or um, you know exhibiting hyperactive uh, behavior um, that's done by the medication so that's that is one thing um, in 1968 the American Psychiatric Association um, took on board for the first time uh, the idea of a hyperkinetic um, behavior hyperkinetic disorder and by 1994 their fourth edition of the, uh, the diagnostic manual they had Id Id identified three types of ADHD uh, mostly inattentive mostly hyperactive and impulsive, and a combined type uh, that includes all three symptoms. I say our time has come. Um, there's a lot of great work being done, um, particularly with the ADHD Foundation and Tony Lloyd in Liverpool. They have the Umbrella Project, um, which has been a fantastic for spreading awareness of neurodiversity. They've had a project in London. They've had a project in Liverpool, in Glasgow. Why not a project in Edinburgh? We need a project in Edinburgh. And what he's talking about all the time is shifting the paradigm away from sitting still in school and being just t t taught at to embracing the different minds that Sophie is talking about, finding different ways to teach children. Um, tech companies now, this is brilliant, tech companies are increasingly recruiting people who are neurodiverse because of the qualities they bring. They want different minds. Dominic Cummings, the only, way, only time I agreed with him was when he said he wanted to have different minds working in Whitehall. And guess what? The newspapers say, oh, you're looking for freaks and um, weirdos. I mean, it's just appalling, this sort of stuff. Because um, what he meant was the creative people. When I did Countdown, I did Countdown at Christmas. It was the Champions Countdown. And I walked in, and 
you know how if you have ADHD, you can recognize other people who are on the spectrum. There's an instinctive recognition. And I thought, I'm sure that these, these people I'm seeing in front of me, sure they, they're, they're on the spectrum, they have ADHD or autism or mild autism, whatever. And they were brilliant. They were there because they were the best in the country. They were incredible brains, incredible minds. And it was just, it was just wonderful to see them in action. We talk about Alexander Graham Bell, Leonardo da Vinci, Mozart, Einstein, Disney, Henry Ford, Richard Branson. Sorry, that doesn't really fit in with Mozart and Einstein, does it really? Um, <laughs> Ingvar Kamprad, he founded IKEA, where are the Swedes? Uh, he had ADHD. And these brains were hiding in, in plain sight. Um, they're still in every workplace today, but we don't see them necessarily because they don't fit that stereotype of a naughty, fidgety child or a low ability or a low intelligence child. Get this, killer facts coming up. 40% of millionaires have dyslexia, 40%. 30 to 35% of business owners and entrepreneurs have either ADHD or dyslexia, or both. So we're talking about 20% of the population who are neurodiverse, but 30 to 35% uh, of those who have ADHD or dyslexia, are, uh, they make up 35% of business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, graduates with ADHD are twice as likely to start their own business after university. So these are incredibly creative minds, and yet we have this problem with government policy for some parts of the UK, it could take six or six, up to six or seven years to get a diagnosis. It's really patchy across the country. Some places it can be 12 months, but six or seven years for a diagnosis of ADHD is a proper scandal. In parts of Scotland, there's no service at all for adults. Um, the threshold for children to get uh, access to CAMS, child med and adult, uh, ch child and adult mental health services um, is very, very high. You have to have an, an eating disorder or exhibit self-harming or attempted suicide. It's a very high threshold to get access to these services. Um, and it doesn't have to be like this. And it's, it's a waste of resources as well because, another killer stat, over the, cost, over the course of a lifetime, the cost of untreated and undiagnosed ADHD over the course of a lifetime is 1.2 million pounds. That's in interventions, in uh, criminal justice proceedings, um, loss of income, all that thing. 1.2 million over the course of a lifetime, undiagnosed ADHD. The cost of diagnosis and treatment from age six to 18 is 9,000 pounds. 1.2 million untreated over life, 9,000 pounds, age six to 18 with diagnosis and treatment. Seems to be a particular problem in Scotland, by the way, um, which has got lower diagnosis rates than the rest of the UK. Um, and I think part of that problem is that I think the Ed Sykes, the educational psychologists in Scotland, some of them don't believe that ADHD exists and that it's a cultural con con construct created by pharma. I mean, yeah, we all agree we don't want to over-medicalize children. I get that. None of us want to do that. But the reality is, whether you believe it exists or not, the reality is, it is a legal diagnostic entity. And if we fail to identify and support these children, they're at greater risk of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, self-harm, and becoming addicts through self-medicating with alcohol or cannabis. Um, these differences that we're talking about, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and autism, they've been around as long as human beings have. They are naturally occurring differences in the vast spectrum of human neurocognitive capability. They're not disordered, as I said before, they're different. And when it comes to children, we, I mean, we disable children when we crush their potential by insisting that they learn like everybody else. I mean, we no longer, do you remember in the days, people used to tie left-handed children's hand to the chair because some idiot somewhere decided that you had to write with your right hand. We don't, we shouldn't be doing it. As a metaphor applies now, the same should be true of children with learning differences. And the cost of forcing them to learn like everyone else is that they experience un unnecessary mental distress and, unavo and avoidable underachievement. And this is happening now in 2023. Over 40% of UK school children now meet the diagnostic criteria for anxiety disorder. That's an astonishing statistic. So all of these things play in the fact that we're not recognizing it, the fact that we're not um, diagnosing it, the fact that we're not looking out for it, the fact that it's going unseen, it's under, uh, below the radar, is creating a great problem in our, in our schools. Um, and we need to listen, we need to, we need to pay attention. And why aren't we paying attention to what our children are trying to communicate to us? Um, 
I mentioned the comedians uh, that have come out with it recently, but here's the thing, get ready for this, guys. The pushback has started. We're seeing these newspaper articles now saying, oh, everyone's got ADHD now. Oh, for heaven's sake, you know. Oh, it's just these, these celebrities, these comedians, they want to get attention. I've seen articles by Dominic Lawson, by Giles Corrin, and they just, they come from a place of such ignorance. Now, what it is, these people, they've got a column to write. And they write this, oh, ADHD, oh, everyone's got ADHD. Da, da, da. They write it off, forget about it. But the pain that, that art those articles create for people who have ADHD, people who are dealing with it, people who are going through it, people, is, is immeasurable. And to have these completely, um, I say, sort of superficial, unhelpful, profoundly damaging um, columns. You, I mean, people would not talk about PTSD like that, would you? I mean, it was known as shell shock in the old. People wouldn't talk about depression like that. They wouldn't talk about bipolar like that. But because it's ADHD, you look down the comments in the newspaper thing and, you know, but maybe because it's associated with celebrities. You read comments like, I sometimes wonder whether celebrity agents trawl through medical dictionaries to see if they can make their clients just that little bit more interesting. Or the problem is when you have these two-bit celebrity yo-yos, that'll be me, um, who start claiming to have them just to appear relevant with the time to raise their profile, to garner some sympathy. I mean, honestly, fuck that. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It really is, because they, what this complete misunderstanding. The fact that many of these people are celebrities or that many of them are comedians in the first place is because they have ADHD. It's not the other way around. They haven't decided, oh, I need to have that to be interesting. It's what's made them what they are, which in many cases has made them famous enough, has made them funny enough, has made them um, energetic enough to be able to be known to the public and have a platform because people recognize them. They relate, they love their work, they enjoy their work, they are high achievers. So we really need to push back hard. People say, oh, you know, ADHD, it's, it's, it's being overdiagnosed. It's not being overdiagnosed. It's being diagnosed. And all this stuff, oh, ADHD, it's, uh, um, this ADHD epidemic. Here's a killer stat. 176,000 people in Britain, 176,000 adults are on ADHD meds. 176,000. You know how many are on antidepressants? 8.3 million, 176,000, we talk about an ADHD epidemic. I mean, it's just, this is what we have to push back against. Um, so I want to encourage you, really, this is my cheerleader bit, to, to fight against the ignorance and the prejudice in the public for the sake of all those creative and exciting minds and their potential. If you struggle uh, with a son or a daughter, you'll know the depths of frustration and despair, the pattern of repeating the same mistakes, the setbacks and the failures that your child has to overcome, the difficulties making and keeping friends, all of that. Um, we need to dig deep. We need to dig deep and champion these young people, champion their minds, and champion their differences. We shouldn't just be tolerating neurodiversity. We should be celebrating it. And I'm going to finish with something I found out. This, in, this very, very, in this very building, I was at a dinner speaking, and the person next to me said they had their daughter uh, was diagnosed with ADHD. They'd gone through university. They had a child. They were doing really well. And I said, how did you, how did you manage? How did you cope? And he said, do you know what? We just loved her. We just loved her. And it's that unconditional, I get it, I understand. And, um, and I just think I would pass on, apart from the same where I started, which is about celebrating ADHD, I would also say, love your friends, your children uh, with ADHD, because they are amazing brains. They're different. And as we know, it takes all kinds of minds. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we have some questions, I think. We have fi five minutes, do we? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rory, for that wonderful and heartfelt uh, speech. I've got lots of questions pouring in, so I will, I will pick a few to get us going. So great to see some from, from schools. Um, so first question from one of our local schools, actually. If you could go back and talk to your teachers, what would you have liked them to know? <laughs> well, I was lucky because I had, uh, there was one teacher who absolutely got Derek Swift, and uh, he just challenged us all the time. Uh, to, he made us think we were much better than we were. Um, he would write, he would, there was a whiteboard like that, and at the end, it would be absolutely full of things. He was teaching us French, but half of the, he'd write in Russian. He'd say, as you'll remember from your Russian, he wrote on that. He'll say, you'll remember from your Serbo-Croat, and he'd write something in Serbo 
their book. And you thought, wow, this is extraordinary. So it made us, it didn't say, oh, it was, oh, well, you better do this before, um, and learn this by rote. It was actually, you know, challenging us to be better. Um, I suppose on the ADHD, the things I was talking about, to look out not just for the child that is hyperactive or restless, but to understand that if, uh, if, that if they are, that that might be coming not from being naughty or from being badly behaved, but from um, anxiety, from learning anxiety, from, uh, from learning differences. And also to look out for the child who may be underperforming or um, who is struggling academically, because it may not be that they're, well, it may very well not be, it, it, it isn't that they're stupid and they're thick. Um, it's because they are struggling and to look, as they do, as I say in Sweden, across the spectrum um, to assess and to catch them while they're young. And that's not so you can medicate them, that's not what I'm saying. It's so that you can put in place some strategies and um, some, there's, I mean, lots of learning tools as well now, um, as I mentioned. I mean, little silly things like if you go to games uh, and you're always forgetting your boots or something, put a label on your bag with a picture of a pair of boots on it. So you'll see every time you go to your bag, that, right, have I got those? Little simple things that you learn. I mean, like we all learn about, you know, keeping your car keys and everything in one place in the house so you know it'll be good. The techniques, I mean, the, you know, the internet's full of them. Attitude is sometimes quite a, that's a, a resource. I, they often, they're full of these articles about, uh, you know, how I cope with my uh, car keys and stuff like that. So I'd, I would just say to, 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 to uh, teachers, just look out, look out for the child that's, that's struggling and they, may, they learn in a different way. That's not that they are difficult, it's that, that they're different. Thank you. We've got someone who's interested to know what focus techniques you use to be able to write. As someone who suffers from ADHD, they say they get distracted by small things. Uh, yeah, well, that, oh, I, I massively do that. Yeah, I haven't exactly been undistracted in the last 45 minutes, have I? Um, so, um, um, well, actually, a piece of advice John Bird gave me. He died just before Christmas. And, um, this is the thing about the empty page. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. There's all sorts of displacement activities when you should be writing down. Think, oh God, this is over. How am I going to start? And he said, don't get it right, get it written. And that means, you know, don't think, don't want about getting it perfect. Just get it on the page. Just, just start, make a start. You know, the first, was it Mandela who said that? The, the rod, oh, I, can't, I, can't remember what he, I can't remember what he said. Um, it was like, the, the rod to freedom, one step at a time or something like that. But anyway, you need to get, you need to, to just, and about uh, being distracted. Well, you will be distracted. Um, I think, again, I, you'd have to look up some, some, uh, some techniques. I mean, there are apps, there's lots of apps to, but the trouble is sometimes you, find, you, you then get lost, you go down a rabbit hole looking at different app apps, and you, after half an hour you think, I've just been looking at apps to help me concentrate while I was supposed <laughs> to be looking. I mean, boy, are we in an ADHD world, by the way. I mean, it's so, uh, I mentioned the, the, you know, the, the open plan office, but my God, the, this world, I don't, the world has never been more set up to pull more on your attention. Everybody's wanting your attention. You go into a shop, you buy a shirt, they say, can we have your email, please, sir? So why is that? So for the receipt? No, it's not. So they can send you stuff to sell you stuff, which means I am stuck back home with 210 emails to answer before I get to the really important one because um, Dunelm want to sell me more blankets or, you know. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, there are apps to help you uh, focus and concentrate, and I guess it's whatever works for you. But, you know, don't worry about making it perfect. Just get it right, don't get it written. D sorry, don't get it right, get it written. One minute, I think. Oh, 30 Final seconds. question. How can we accelerate getting rid of ignorance in the society about neurodiversity? We just have to talk about it. We have to celebrate it, and we have to remind people, look at those statistics. Tech companies are ahead of us here. Uh, our time has come. Uh, people are recruiting, are going out of their way to recruit people who are neurodiverse because of what they bring. And we just have to keep banging that drum, keep putting that message forward that actually the ones who eat the poison fruit, uh, they can be the trailblazers, they can be the pathfinders. They have immense value um, to society. And if we have 40% of millionaires dyslexic, 35% of company owners uh, with ADHD and dyslexia, they are, the, it's, it's an asset, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a liability. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, and thank you so much, Rory. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much, Absolutely fantastic.